Oh, that was a lot louder than I expected. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Medina Ramirez. Uh, thank you for having me here at Tic Tech. And uh, I'm going to use this time to talk about a research project we undertook at Open North, uh, the organization I work for, uh, on our online participatory budgeting platform. And um, before I dive into that, I'll I'll talk a little bit about ourselves. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a Montreal-based organization. Um, we are guided by doing applied research, a lot of multi-stakeholder engagement, partnerships, uh, and we try to boost the effectiveness of the community and social movements and initiatives. And I know it's a little rude to talk about ourselves, but uh, one of the purposes of this presentation is pushing the idea that uh, we are civic technology, open data people that are going into the participatory budgeting space, and and that's something that's not not happening enough, in in my humble opinion. Um, that's some of the people who we work with. If one of you is here, thank you for working with us. All right, so we can dive into the presentation. In this 20 minutes or so, uh, I will demonstrate how our uh, light approach to participatory budgeting has had actual impact on uh, the Canadian context and impact as we've learned over the past two days is a very loaded word. Um, so I'm going to begin by discussing our approach to measure an impact which might be a little different uh, from what we traditionally see in the participatory budgeting field. Um, I will also, given our definition of impact, try to situate this within the larger civic technology and impact literature. And then I'll, I'll talk about the exercise, some of the results we had, and then uh, I'll keep pushing some of our research agenda on all of you. So again, so what was our motivation for research? Um, so we found that we were sitting on five years of fairly consistent data on participatory budgeting. It was a longitudinal, relatively large end study, and this don't tend to exist very much in participatory budgeting. Um, the way the field developed was, was very suddenly and, and pushed by a variety of different actors. And it sort of developed independent of each other, which is very, very different from, from the civic technology and open data movements, which have more centralized events. So uh, participatory budgeting became widely popular really fast. But uh, we, we never really understood what impact it was having. And, and this, again, reminds me of a lot of the conversations we've been having um, this past couple of days on the unexpected. Um, results of some of the work we, we have undertaken. And we're also thinking of, 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 of starting to bring this tool abroad. Um, Citizen Budget, uh, our tool, uh, became widely popular in, in Canada, some, somewhat unexpectedly. Uh, it is used now by over 100 cities, and it's been used close to 150 times uh, all across Canada and a few in the States and, and France as well. So, so what does our tool look like? It, it, it looks something like this. Um, we use real fiscal data provided to us by the municipalities. We work very closely uh, with the bureaucrat on the data. And, and then we adapt this data so that citizens can easily understand it and uh, use it and play around with it. Uh, one of the main purposes of the tool is, is educational, showing citizens uh, the drawbacks and the advantages of choosing different services and of shifting the, the city budget. Um, and in this way, hopefully, lead to, to better communications and better understanding of government functions. So when we already took this, this, this research, we, we wanted to ask, what, what do we mean by impact? Is it just a brute measure, such as numbers, number of instances of participation, or web visits, or, or bounce rates, things we've observed uh, being tracked in other civic technology tools? Um, we, we also wonder if we should uh, pin impact on policy outcome. Uh, does a citizen's particular preference or feedback lead to a particular policy outcome? And uh, we also wondered if it was citizen perceptions of government. And um, I'm going to put a little asterisk on that, because measuring trust and trust in government, is, it's quite tricky. And um, as is very often the case in this kind of research, we found that um, it was a combination of all this. So we came up with this, well, we didn't come up with, but we uh, found this framework in the literature that we found could be really useful for tracking this impact. Um, 
and we were trying to move beyond our traditional understanding of, of what technology tools should should look and what we should track. Um, so again, we, we came with this dichotomy of uh, tangible and intangible in impacts and um, Intangible is a bit of a misnomer because these are very trackable. So uh, under tangible, and I'll give some examples from our research on, on what this means, we have um, very physical things, reports, policies, policy decisions. And intangible are more the, the bread and butter of, of, of our field, uh, participant empowerment, uh, increased trust, and, and all these uh, very buzzwordy words we, we sometimes are guilty of using. Okay, so what do this sort of impact, what were we exactly looking for in our 90 plus cities database? Um, well, it's, it's things like Councillor Linda Busi in the city of Yellowknife in the Canadian North, uh, using a citizen budget report and report to justify one of her votes in front of council. Um, or it was the deputy major of, of Morinville, a small town in Alberta, uh, deciding to, under a unanimous motion, defer a vote on the public city library because after consulting with citizens, they found that um, citizens did not want uh, the library to be defunded. Or finally, the, the town of Perry Sound, which is a small rural community of 5,000 people in Ontario, um, my home province, sort of, um, where they decided to integrate participatory budgeting schemes into their overall budgetary processes. So every year before doing the budget, they decided to ingrain budgetary um, engagement as part of that. And if we go back to our little outcomes form, we, we see evidence of, of policy decisions, of, of, of policies. Maybe the policy wasn't implemented, but the fact that they deferred uh, that decision points to new processes and new institutions. On, on the intangible side, we, we had this very nice quote from uh, Robert Nicolay, which is a city manager in, in Grand Prairie, another small city in northern Alberta. And he mentioned how he found that after implementing Citizen Budget, this online participatory budgeting tool for several years, he found that his citizens were far more receptive and that they were already used to participating in this kind of engagement, that, that they were contributing very helpful feedback to him that might have not been there present uh, if, he, if they had not implemented this sort of tool or this engagement mechanism. And again, this, this points to, to all these things that we always look for, uh, participant empowerment, uh, improvements of understanding of government and, and willingness to participate in the future. And again, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a time discussing impact um, because in the participatory budgeting field and perhaps in the wider civic technology field, we had this high expectation at the beginning that, that we found the panacea that was gonna solve all our democratic problems, that, that we were gonna finally evolve into this sort of Aristotelian democratic society, um, that we would, we would reach uh, this perfect democracy. But after 30 years of participatory budgeting in particular, we found that that, that wasn't the case. And, and some of the participatory budgeting pioneers, such as Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte in Brazil, were starting to become very disillusioned with the idea of, of participatory budgeting. And I'm not here to say that participatory budgeting has had no impact. What I want to say is that it's had impact we weren't tracking, and that perhaps as a community, we should start tracking these forms of impact instead of focusing on policy outcomes or on participation levels. And so to further advance this point, we, we used our, our large qu uh, quantitative data set um, to test a couple of other uh, long-held beliefs in the field. So does uh, previous uh, democratic culture affect people uptaking participatory budgeting or online schemes? Um, and it was very interesting, the last presentation in Paraguay, seeing how people were really encouraged in the context to, to participate, even though they didn't expect their feedback to be heard. And it is very telling of, of the, the place where the Paraguayan democracy is uh, compared to other types of democracies. Um, and the second thing we tested is does low participation lead to, to cities, which was our main measure of analysis, uh, halting use of participatory budgeting tools or online tools. And we found that neither of this was the case, that 
despite having different democratic cultures and or democratic health and and here I, I want to in the interest of transparency I want to say that we used um, levels like previous levels of voting in each city as a proxy for measuring democratic health and we did this because that's the one consistent measure across cities that we can compare so one vote once one person uh, and it doesn't vary that much from city to city so so we figured this could be a good proxy measure um, anyways we found that there was no real correlation between how healthy a city's democracy was compared to whether they decided to participate a lot or not uh, on our exercise and we also track cities that have done this for four or five years uh, to see if, if changes in in the participation rates led to them not having the same source of impact that, that I was discussing earlier in the, in the qualitative um, portion of the exercise. And, and we found that, no, this, this wasn't the case either. Cities still found, despite having not necessarily high participation numbers or despite uh, having different spikes in participation numbers, that, that they kept participating and they kept getting some of the, the wonderful benefits of social learning that, that we observed. So this is all super encouraging for us. So after finding this and after keep going with the research, we, we, we wanted to go a little farther with what we can do with these data sets and we wanted to go a little bit farther with the participatory budgeting field. Um, so we started asking how can we use this information, this massive amounts of information we capture in, in this, in this uh, participatory budgeting tools and in these engagement tools we use online um, with open data, how we can link them so that others outside our tool and outside our community can use them. And then since trust is so hard to measure, we, we, we still want to find out how, how should we go about, about measuring trust. So we started collaborating with the Privy Council Office uh, in Canada, which is uh, the office in charge of collating all the ministry information for the Prime Minister to, to check and, and to be able to make informed decisions. And we decided to collaborate with them so that in every chance they get a uh, to consult and feedback for citizens that they can actually use that feedback in data-driven solutions and transforming a lot of that qualitative feedback into usable data and uh, also to advise them in this feedback so that in, in gathering this feedback so that they themselves could could use this feedback to transform it into a qualitative quantitative into quantitative uh, information and then for trust is something we started recently um, on how do we measure trust in, in government and, and we found that it's, it's really tricky because perceptions of trust are, are tied to understandings and misunderstandings of government roles. Uh, a recent survey by the Pew Research Center found that only 19% of, of Americans uh, trusted their government. However, when asked about specific services that the government provided, most of them agreed that government was doing a really good job and uh, except for one which was in immigration and no this was before Donald Trump and the Mexican wall became a thing um, so the point with this slide and, and, and with this point is that that pinning impact of our tools on trust is not necessarily the best measure because government trust is shaped by cultural attitudes and it's shaped by too many different actors such as the media, misinformation, well you were a morning on Twitter and you saw an angry post by Donald Trump. Um, and on that note too, um, there's a research by a marketing firm that showed that the most trusted institutions uh, in different countries were the Chinese Communist Party and Vladimir Putin, uh, two very anti-democratic uh, entities. So uh, pinning the health of our democracies and the impact of our tools on, on perceptions of trust might not be the best idea. Um, Again, we saw other things in, in citizen budget that, that speak to the wider civic technology literature. There's uh, institutionalization of the tools. Uh, um, the tools survived um, changes in government and changes in staff. Uh, it, it's low tech and it doesn't require a lot of expertise, which is important for designing these kind of tools. And it's easy to implement for the citizens, so it's not, and for the uh, 
city employee as it's not as hard to to grasp with the technology. And there's city official buying. There's a co-creation process, if you will, between us and the and the bureaucrat. The bureaucrat provides us the data. The bureaucrat designs the site itself, and we're there more as a support. Um, and this this really leads to. I, I work a lot with this with these people and talk with with a lot of municipal leaders, and, and this really leads them to to be very invested in the tool. And so, what are some counter arguments on this presentation that I've given and, and of our approach? That it's a, a top heavy approach. Uh, participatory budgeting is traditionally viewed. As, as a, as a bottom-up approach, or it was at its start. Um, so that's, that's a fair criticism. It is a top-heavy approach and has developed into a top-heavy approach. But we just need to look out for some of the dangers that involve this top-heavy approach, such as the process being hijacked by political interests, or, or the power dynamics of, 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 of government simply missing a portion of the population under feedback. And, and this can be mitigated by collaborating with, with civil society, um, we hope. And uh, will it translate to other contexts? Well, we don't know. There's some interesting work coming out of Kenya since they passed some legislation to make participatory budgeting and online and consultation with uh, citizens mandatory in budgetary processing and budgetary decision making. So it'll be very interesting to, to see what comes out of Kenya and if there's any possibilities to compare with Canada. And are we cherry picking impact? Are we just looking for things that look like impact where there aren't any? Are we just adapting our definition of impact so we can pat ourselves in the back and say we did a good job? And I think that's a fair criticism and we did control for a lot of end variables and we double blinded the study. But uh, that being said, the point of the presentation is not to say that other forms of impact such as tracking, um, instances of participation or border perceptions are completely nullifiable. It's the point to say that there's way more other forms of impact that we should be tracking. And by tracking these forms of impact, we can come to better understand the effect that our tools are having and give us ourselves a little breathing room. Um, and on that note, I would like to thank you for paying attention to me. Have a good day. Oh, and contact me if, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christian.